It's uh, interesting, the last worship song we just did, it began with this. It said, I can't go back to the beginning. And um, I like playing those games, taking the proverbial time machine and like, where would you go? And like, part of me would want to go see a mammoths and just see how big they are. Um, part of me would want to go to like the beginning of America because I'm a nerd and I just want to see all these people in powdered wigs. Uh, part of me would want to go to the beginning, the real, real beginning Eden, right at creation, and just see what this world, what the garden was like before everything, before, before us. And, and I would do my best not to get detoured and go smack Adam or give him at least a stern talking to, but I'd want to see what does this earth look like before we messed it up. And many of you know I love, love, love going to the mountains. There's something about the mountains that just like helps my soul. And uh, my family just got back about 10 days ago. We go to up in Mammoth area to uh, this place called June Lake. We go there every year. And in June Lake, there's this one rock that you drive down and see. There's a picture of it right here. Stefan's going to throw it up in a second. Have, have any of you guys seen that, gone up there? Now, I like playing this game as I do on, go on road trips, and I see different things like that. And I just think that rock was placed there by God. Now, if you think about it, there's no reason a human could place it there. And it would take, I'm, I'm confident we could figure out a way to do it, but there's no reason for it. And I don't have any reason to believe that rock was put there at any time by any human, which is really, really bizarre for me to think about. One day, thousands of years ago, God chose to just place that rock there in creation. And it's been sitting there ever since. Like that, I don't know if you guys nerd out like that or if that's just me and I'm, I'm just extra special that way. But I love to see things, rock formations, mountains, something, and just think that is exactly how God created it. That's how he wanted it. You know, in Genesis 1, we're actually going to be there. So if you guys have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis 1. But Genesis 1, you guys know the story. God created the heavens and the earth on day one. Day two, he creates a few more things, and he he keeps building up. Day six comes around, he creates all the animals, and then he creates us, mankind. He creates man, and then there's a, a gap, and I don't know how long during that day it took them to figure out that Adam needed some help, but it wasn't that long. And then they found, and then they made Eve. And so Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day. And then we have this idea, this picture, or at least the way uh, this guy I've been listening to, his name's Jordan Rayner, the way he puts it is, is every single children's book, day six ends, day seven it says God rests, and then there's a period, and there's an end, and that's it. And all creation is done. Except it isn't. In fact, creation for God... Most of what he creates and what he builds ends at day six. He rests at day seven. But what I want to talk about tonight is that at the end of day six wasn't the end of creation, but rather it was the time when God said, all right, I'm done. At least I'm mostly done. And he passes the baton off to us. He says, I've created and now it's your turn. And I want to talk about what that really looks like. So if you guys have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 26. And it says, Then God said, Let us, and again, you've heard me say us is referring to the Trinity. It says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth, most of which I do not like. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. It's a lot there. Not tonight. Another time. Uh, Verse 28, God blessed them. And here's where I want to stay for most of tonight. He said, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, 
And every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he made, and behold, it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. God said, all right, I've created all of this, and I ended it with you. I created uh, us, human, humankind, and he made us in his image, and he set us apart, right? The fancy word for that is Imago Dei, and he says, and now, tag, now you're it. Now it's your turn. He says, I have created all of this, and I want you to carry on with what I've done. You know, this passage, you guys, if you've been around a while, you've heard me teach on this passage a lot. There's a lot in this. We've talked about work and how God created work. And work was created before the fall, which means it's good. In fact, it's, it, we need work. It's, I, I'm curious, but I have a small feeling that there's going to be some sort of work in heaven. I'm not sure what that looks like. Well, I can debate God about it later. But... Um, but we're not going to talk about work tonight. I'm going to make a little bit of an assumption, and I hope you guys know that we need to work. We need to work hard. We need to fill our day and, and be like really work hard and with excellence. And if you have any questions about that, you can look on YouTube for my last message or go to the Katie's podcast. Yesterday's podcast was all about that. Yeah. yeah okay. See. But I don't want just to talk about work, but I want to talk about the vision with which we work. It's not enough for you to know I need to work hard, but what God is saying in this passage is I don't just want you to work hard, but I want you to work hard for these things that I have started, that I'm trusting you to continue, to, to take the baton. I've, I've created something, and now I want you to continue in work to create and build off what I've created. You know, we've talked about these verses in regard to family and God's design for family. And I said, we're not going there tonight, except it's important for we to know that we're not just called to be fruitful and multiply and just fill the earth with babies, right? We need to fill the earth with babies, but also we need to fill the earth with structure and with truth and with change. And we need to provide, we need to work hard and create a world that these babies that we're going to fill the earth with have something to inherit and to walk in and to continue building what we've done. God said, I'm going to create something, and I'm going to do most of my work, I'm going to call it mostly done on day six, and then I'm going to hand it off to you. Have you guys ever handed off a project or something that you've really worked hard on, and then you've given it to someone else, and you've, you're like, I'm trusting you with this. I think about uh, three years ago when I stepped into this position and I handed off Youth Venture and I spent 10 years building up Youth Venture. That was hard. And, and I wanted to be here and I was really grateful for the people that were stepping up there. It wasn't like I had a lack of faith there, but it was just I had poured so much of my life. I, did, I had done so much work building this up and then to hand it off, the trust and that it, w- it was just something that was difficult. It was hard. I think about in the future, I have two daughters. And so these two daughters, there's going to come a day when I'm going to walk down an aisle, I'm going to be crying like a little lady, and I'm going to hand them off to someone. I'm handing them off. Literally, that's what it's called. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? And I'm going to have to do that. And so all of this time, they're like, 47 years, because that's how, no, I'm not going to make them wait that long. That'd be torture. The, the, the years that I've invested in my daughters, I'm saying, I'm going to trust you, this man, with them. And, and I'm handing off the authority to you. That's hard. That's heavy. And I think about the canvas that the Lord created here on earth. And he spent these six days creating every mountain range and the ocean, every animal, and all of these things. And then at the end of the six days, he says, okay, this canvas is beautiful. It's incredible. It's intentional. It's purposeful. It's designed. And now I'm trusting you 
to continue to cultivate and to keep, to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue it and to rule over it. That was a big... I think about even when the pastors here said, hey, David, we're going to let you take over the college ministry. There's something about that that makes me feel, I'm, I feel a bit of confidence because these guys say I, they trust me. And I feel a little bit of, and I, I still feel this way, like a, a little bit of intimidation or inadequacy and not like, I'm not like crazy and secure, don't worry. But, but there's something substantial about this that I think requires us to take like, we shouldn't jump into it easily. And there's something substantial about the call that God has given us to continue on what he started that should, at least for a little bit, make us really take a step back and take a deep breath. These passages in Genesis 1 26 through 28, it's called, it has three different names. It's called the dominion mandate or the cultural mandate or another one is the creation mandate. And it's where God says, all right, I have started something and it's your turn to to continue. And I don't want to call it tonight work, but I want to call it creation. I want to call it the call that we have, the call to create. And I believe the Lord has called all of us to continue to create more and more the way he started. And I want to use that term create because work, we could just mindlessly work. But creation, to create something takes intentionality. It takes us being purposeful. It takes us putting design into something. Ephesians 2.10, God says that we are his workmanship. That word is poema, and that talks about the intentionality that God put into us. But what's cool about here is he goes on to echo what I believe he was saying in Genesis 1, where he says, you were created, you are my workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. I created you with intention so then you could go out and create other things that are good and intentional. And these things God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what is creation? What is this? You know, before Jesus and before, uh, even if, if you lived in the middle of nowhere and you never talked to another person, the Bible says that the earth testifies of who he is. Romans 1.20 says we don't have an excuse, that, that all of us have in, in eternity in our hearts that we have something within us that longs for the Lord. Psalm 19.1 puts it this way. He says, uh, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. The ex- their expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. He's talking about all this creation. Yet their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun. All of the all of creation is declaring the work of his hands. And God says, All right, I created Yosemite and Half Dome and the Himalayans, and I've created uh, every incredible mountain and valley and the Grand Canyon. I've created all this, and all of this testifies of me. People will look at this and they will understand, even if they don't want to, that there's design and purpose behind this. He says, okay, and now I want you to pick up the baton. And now it's our turn to create. And hopefully, what we create will do the exact same thing. It will testify of God's goodness. Matthew 5, 16 says this, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And this is one of those things that as I'm writing this, as I'm thinking about it, it does a couple things. It makes me, one, feel like I'm not that special. 
And I hope part of you, like you're not, like we should understand that what God has created, we can't create, the only way we can come close to creating anything like it is because we're using the tools he's given us and because we're made in his image. So it's not like I'm clearly not God and I'll never get close to God. But God is saying, I can live a life, I can create a life where my good works, based on what he's allowed me to do because of his goodness, because of his, uh, the revelation I have of who he is. So clearly, I'm trying to make it real clear that this is not about me, but I can, who I am, create a life that people will look at and it will testify of God, just like the mountains and just like the creation God has put. Like I have the ability to go out and choose God and people will see that and have an ability to go choose him as well. And this idea of creating, some of you are like, this is nice. I'm not an artist in any way. Yes, trust me, you draw better than I do. I guarantee it. Uh, I make stick figures look bad. But creating is not just for artists. And we're not, when, when God first gave this creation mandate, he gave them a garden. Now, I do want to tell you this. God created like the Garden of Eden, but then he told them to go and cultivate and keep it, which is just kind of frustrating. I got into gardening during the pandemic because that's what you did. And uh, gardening gardening's frustrating. And if God could create, like if he could go do it all, and then he makes, I don't know. But we're not doing that. That's not us. Right? We don't have a garden, and God's not calling you all to be artists or, or Bob Rosses or anything like this. But at one point, all you needed to know to, to fulfill this was to cultivate and keep the land and keep God's word. But we are not expanding a garden. We're expanding the kingdom of God. And it's a little bit different. It's not defined by some political border. It's not defined by mountain ranges. It's not defined by any of those things. It's defined by where are people that believe in God and who follow him. So we have this opportunity to expand the kingdom of God when we create cultures, communities, families where God's rule is lifted up and where people can come in and walk in his ways. We get to, to be a part of something like that. And so in order to truly fulfill this call, in order to truly expand the kingdom of God, we need to know every field of study. We're not talking about creation in regards to just painting or sculpting or creating things like that. But we have a ton of engineers in here. Like half of you are engineers. And when you go, God created, he started it. He created the laws of nature. And then you engineers get a nerd out and expand how we understand those things, what we can do with them, and create new ways that we can properly steward and take care of this earth and be masters of whatever form of engineering you're, you're learning. All of that helps us rule over what God has called us to rule over and glorify his name. Create within your field new, exciting things that people can look to and say, man, God is good. Everything he's created is clearly designed and how he's trusted us with it is, is just something that leaves us in awe. Nurses, a third of you are nurses. God created our abilities to heal. But you can deep dive into this field of medicine and you could create new ways or new applications so that our bodies can use the things that God has given us to heal quicker or you could go out and study and figure out new ways that we can apply nature and medicine to the things that God has already begun when he created us. And it doesn't end there. We can take anything, nurses, if you want to just expand there, you want to create an atmosphere where people come in that are hurting and lost. And I've heard story after story of nurses being the one that creates, create, they build an atmosphere within a hospital, this place that could be so dark and hard and difficult, and they create something, that, uh, an area that is loving. What fields are you in? What are you studying? What is your work? To that, God says, 
I've started something. And I want you to work hard, but I don't want you just to work hard to work hard. I want you to work hard because I have chosen to partner with you. And I've begun something that I want you to continue. I want you to keep creating for my glory so that people may look at you and see your good works and glorify my name. We as Christians are called to create homes that honor the Lord, communities that build up one another, missions that seek the lost. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, is a continuing of the creation mandate. He says, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's saying, Even in this new covenant, I want you to go and create new disciples. And again, I'm not God. They're not going to be disciples by believing in me. That's not how it works. But God has begun something in me and has given me the wisdom by his grace to understand his ways in these divine mysteries. And God says, I want to use you. He wants to use me to lead people to him and create something bigger than us. This gives purpose to what we create. This is why I want to teach this tonight. You are all in the stages of life where over the next 60, 70, 80 years, you're going to create what it is that you're going to call your life. And I want you to know that your life, what you're creating, it's not about you. Or at least if, if we do it right, it's going to be about something bigger than you. And it's also not something that you're starting off fresh, brand new. It's all like up to you. We come from way different backgrounds, different stories. Some of you have incredible parents and some of you don't. Some of you have a lot of money and some of you are broke. Some of you have different advantages because of health or because of skills or because of whatever. And some of you are struggling there. And to every single one of you, wherever you at, You're at, God says, hey, you're not starting fresh. You're not starting on your own. And you're not starting just trying to figure out what you could do to scrape by so that at the end of this life, you could say, well, I lived a decent life for me. At least you don't have to. What God wants you to do is know him and really know him as your Lord and Savior. And then pick up this baton to come and continue what he's begun. And what we've been able, what all of us, thankfully, we're stepping into a place that men and women of faith for hundreds and thousands of years before us have already done this. And we're, we're continuing what they've been doing. We're picking up the baton. We're saying, God, I'm going to continue expanding your kingdom and creating homes that honor you and building community and creating careers that people are going to look to and say, that person must know God. How do we do this? Every great artist has a teacher and every piece of art uses different tools or mediums and things like that. I looked it up today. Monet had this uh, mentor that that he went to. And Michelangelo started apprenticing under someone at age 13. It's interesting. We don't know their... You could look up their names. I did earlier. I already forgot it. That like, they're in some ways, nobodies. And yet these incredible artists looked to them, learned from them, and then created something. And, and what we have is a, an ability to learn from our mentor, from our apprentice, from our teacher, Jesus, and to create something. But our hope is that people won't remember our names, but that they'll know the Lord through it. Discipleship, we've talked about this. Here at Common Ground, we're about three things, right? Community, discipleship, and purpose. What we aim to do, what I really pray and seek the Lord, I try to do, is to create a community where you guys are lifted up. 
The way we learn how to create things is we go to God in discipleship. Discipleship is when we go to God and we say, Jesus, I want to be like you. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to be your apprentice. And the goal of an apprentice is to become the master. So we learn to create like God did by going to God and learning his ways. You know, there's different techniques in art. Well, there's different virtues in Christianity. And so if you want to create, you need to go to God and say, I want to be your apprentice. And you say, I'm going to submit to Jesus. And then you learn to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And you learn to walk in selflessness and in truth and in love and in mercy. And all of those things are techniques, ways that we create something bigger than us. Luke 6, 40 says this, A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. And that's what we get to do, is we get to say, God, I want to partner with you. I want to continue what you've done, and I want to learn from you by picking up all these traits and qualities that you have exemplified. Lastly, I'm going to wrap this up. Every piece of art has an audience in mind. I'm a, I nerd out a little bit on art. I'm a nerd. I nerd out in a lot. But there's this piece uh, in Washington, D.C., the Lincoln Memorial. And you know, giant Lincoln up sitting there, and he moves around and night at the museum, too. And Seth real, plays a pivotal role in that. But uh, in the... In the actual statue, you could go visit it. The sculptor's daughter was deaf. And so the way he sculpted Abraham Lincoln is his hands are loosely signing A and L on the bench as he's there. And what I love about that is the sculptor had his audience in mind. He, but his audience wasn't this like giant nation that would come by and see everything it was it was his daughter. I love that. You know, they give credit for Michelangelo for painting at the Sistine Chapel the dark corners and paying hours and hours of, taking hours and hours to paint that. I don't know if this really happened, but everyone says it did. So, and somebody goes like, why are you doing that? No one will see it. And he, he responds famously, God will. God sees it. And I hope he says that. Right, that'd be cool. Now we can see it because we've lit up the whole place with electricity. Who's our audience? When we create, we're creating because we're picking up what God has started. We're creating because we recognize that God has done something in us. He has created in us a new heart. And we're responding to that grace by saying, I'm going to take what you've done in me and I'm going to continue I'm going to take what you've done in me and what you've create, started in creation. I'm going to continue it. We, we start to create things for his kingdom and for his glory by going out and learning his ways and walking in his attributes. But the whole time, the audience is him. If we do this right, other people will see. And if you live your life according to God's way, people will notice. And we want people to notice to a degree so that they can come to know the Lord, but it's truly not about them. Our audience is the Lord. We do this for him. We do this because he trusted us, allowed us, empowered us to do it. Psalm 90, 17 says this, that the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. And may he establish the work, may establish what we create, the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Can I have the band come up? I want to challenge you guys in this. What are you creating? And even more than that, what do you want to create in this life? I think about San Diego and California, and it, it's easy to be depressed sometimes about, all right, how am I going to etch some sort of living 
in this place. I think about Biden, America, say what you want. Finances are tough right now. Gas is crazy high, inflation is crazy high, and it's easy to be in your seat, and I'm feeling it right there, and just like, Lord, what am I going to create? What am I going to do in this? Because I'm just kind of scraping by. And I want to encourage you. God did not tell us to do these things because he needed us to do something while we are on earth. He did not give us work just so we would be busy. But God said, and, and he had you in mind when he handed things off. And he knows we're not perfect. He knows better than we do. And yet he's saying, I want you to continue what I began. What I began in the garden and with creation, I want you to continue. What I began with Jesus and the cross, I want you to continue. Jesus said that we are going to do greater things than the miracles that he performed if we trust him. He said, I want you to continue that. So my challenge for you is this. Look ahead and walk with confidence. Right now I'm reading in my devotions the book of Joshua. And God said, everywhere you walk, everywhere where your feet tread is yours. And he says, every battle you enter into, you can trust that I am with you and that I will give you victory. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that really would feel like to run into battle knowing that, that people die in battle, that I'm going up against a ton of people that their goal, their hope, their passion is to see me dead. And yet none of that should shake, worry me at all because I have God on my side. For us, thankfully, we don't have that. We don't have to run into those battles. But what we have to do is enter into this world and this culture and trust that wherever we go, God is with us. And we carry with him, in, with us, sorry, we carry him with us, his spirit within us. And just like he continued working through the patriarchs of our faith, he continued working with Joshua. He continued working with the disciples after Jesus. God says, I want to continue with you creating something that is bigger than you. Trust me and run after it. Don't get apathetic. Don't get fearful. But let me be your God and trust me. Let's create something.